Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to today's event, the 2024 Beverage Trends, Quenching Your Consumer's Thirst for Functional. We're really glad to have you here with us today. I think we've got some really interesting information and, and points for discussion. My name is Denise Center. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of Edlong. At Edlong, we use our expertise in flavor, applications, culinary, and sensory to help companies like yours develop unique signature profiles and solve your biggest flavor challenges using dairy and dairy type flavors. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Please note that the slides are gonna advance automatically through the presentation. If you need to enlarge the slides, click the enlarge slides button, which is located in the top right corner of your presentation window. And if you get stuck or need technical assistance, there is a help widget located at the bottom left corner on your console. We also want to really encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation. There is a Q&A widget in the bottom of your console, a little Q&A box, and we will follow those questions through the webcast and try to answer them as we go along or during the Q&A session. But if a fuller answer is needed and we're unable to address that during this presentation, we will follow up with you via email. So please make sure that you put your questions in the box. Also, stay to the end of the webinar. We do have an exclusive offer for a demo of functional beverages that we have developed that I think you'll find very interesting. So to get started, as we are all here because we are seeing consumers really start to, to prioritize these better for you options. And beyond the typical things that have been around for a very long time, hydration, energy, protein, consumers are really starting to ask for very specific, specific functional capabilities, things that really help them um, with more specific functional needs that they have. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the category overall and really separate out how functional foods dif differ from the broader better for you category, speak to some of the trends and drivers in the market. You may have some of this information. I think some others are, are things that we're really seeing in practice every day. And we will speak to what are some of the challenges with taste because these ingredients definitely bring those to bear. I wanna welcome my colleagues, Anne-Marie Butler, who's the Global Director of Strategy and Innovation for Ed Long, and Dr. Berend Kohler, the Global Vice President of R&D. Berend and Anne-Marie, will you please take a minute and introduce yourselves? Okay, yes, uh, so I'm gonna start. Hello exactly. everyone, uh, my name is Berend Kohler. I'm the Global VP of Research and Development at Ed Long. My team is working to develop new and exciting dairy and dairy type flavors that aim to deliver those preferred taste experience that everyone is looking for. So we're working with all kinds of food matrices, technologies, and really a wide range of applications. Our range of solutions also include dairy type flavors that do not contain any dairy components, but deliver the same you know, dairy profile experience that you would expect from a real dairy, dairy flavor. So we have a very diverse team with significant technical breadth and depth in flavor development, applications, sensory, culinary, and also applied research we also have a global footprint with an R&D hub and innovation center that is located in the US, which is also where I am based, and two additional R&D facilities in Mexico and in Ireland. Great, thank you, Bernd. Anne-Marie? Hi, everyone. Um, as Denise mentioned, my name is Anne-Marie Butler, and I'm our global director of strategy and innovation. Uh, my accent probably gives it away, but I'm based out of our Ireland office, and I spend my time interacting with customers at different events and really gathering up that trend and innovation information so that we can use it internally. Thanks, Denise. Thank you. That's great. All right. So just kind of a quick level set in the market. I think we all know functional beverages have really been around a very long time, um, but they've been primarily focused around narrow segments in the market. And Many of those segments, because they highly value the benefits, 
have had lower expectations in terms of taste settling for function over all other things. The obvious ones are things that are focusing focused on athletes, um, the infirmed or elderly, babies, but also there's been a growing group of people in sort of the personal productivity and and um, space. And, and I think that we're really starting to see that grow. And the real driver around that has been the the whole influencer community, starting with these online influencers and celebrity influencers who invited in scientists and physicians that they've worked with. And it has really brought the whole um, awareness of, of functional ingredients and functional foods into the forefront. In fact, um, Andrew Huberman out of Stanford University has the top podcast globally right now, and he is full on a scientist bringing scientific information to the public. So I think we can really see that people have more access to information, and that is is being brought to bear. So with that, we're seeing much more focused demand. And um, I think we've seen um, a number of studies, including the International Food Information Council that did a really good study with a very thorough survey this past year, um, really kind of bring about what are consumers looking for. So I'd really recommend taking a look at what they brought to bear. Still, um, energy and weight loss, you know, hit the top, but you find other things like gut health and clarity and cognitive function and improved sleep starting to really rise in there. So I think that as we see this, we have the challenges of looking at even our ready to drink beverages that are already on the shelf. Because if someone sees yours, and it's an energy drink, but somebody sees someone else's and it's an energy drink that has some adaptogenic function, um, people are gonna be very likely, a very large percentage of the population are gonna be very likely to reach up and grab that. I think you're gonna hear um, Anne-Marie and Bairn talk about um, you know, the top categories and things that are being affected, but if you're working with anything from coffees, teas, plant-based milks, milkshakes, all of those kinds of things are really being affected by this. Anne Marie and Bernd, um, will you guys take a minute and really talk about some of these key factors? Bernd, why don't you start? Yes, I think um, you know that, that was a really good, good overview of, um, already, Denise. So I think in general, when you take a step back, what uh, we see in the market today is that consumers are generally looking at following healthier lifestyles. When I say lifestyles, I mean a really holistic approach to personal health that includes not only physical activity, but also diets. And that's exactly what, what we're talking about here. We know from Innova Market Insights that three in five consumers that were surveyed globally say that healthier living not only means exercise, but also healthier and more nutritious food. So it's always these two things that need to come together. And we see also that food companies, as you mentioned, have responded to this trend by developing and commercializing healthier products. And in the past, you know, this journey for healthier products has been mainly focused around reducing nutrients that are recommended to be limited in our diet, such as less salt, less saturated fatty acids, and less sugars, And uh, which is a trend that was and continues to be influenced and of course supported by public health policies, dietary guidelines, and also front of pack nutrition labeling requirements in many markets around the world. But what we're seeing today is an evolution of this further in that health space from just reducing negative nutrients, nutrients towards adding functional ingredients. And you alluded to this, right? Ingredients that have a specific purpose, a specific physiological benefit, or support specific body functions like immunity, energy, focus, you know, gut, heart health, or relaxation, or even improved sleep. So. I think that's what we're seeing right now. And I don't know, um, Anne-Marie, if you wanna maybe build on that. Sure, I mean, I don't disagree with anything. I think the key thing here is that consumers are really taking ownership for their health. So instead yeah. of us trying to educate all the time, they're educating themselves. 
And like you mentioned earlier, Denise, you did mention influencers and social media. This does play a massive role. I know myself, I follow different doctors on Instagram to get little pockets of information, but I tailor that information to what suits me because there's so many product offerings out there. It's very much about what I think my needs are, be it sleep, be it gut health, be it nutrition, extra protein, whatever it is in your specific time. And I think that's what the variety and the choice that that's on the market these days is bringing to this segment. And one of the big drivers, I think. Agreed. And I think, I think one of the things that we've seen in terms of the timing around this is, is mm -hmm. kind of going through COVID and really coming out of that. I mean, we are seeing a lot of demand around immunity, but, but also just general drive toward this, this health stuff. I was speaking with the two of you I know um, yesterday and saying, you know, I have a 17 year old in my household who is a dance athlete, but has all these various athlete friends. And these young people are coming to my house and telling me that they're no longer just drinking regular sodas or they're, that, you know, they've got a lot more awareness than certainly I had at, at that age. So I think that that is, um, you know, that that is really a, an important thing to, you know, to get to, um, you know, I think let's, let's kind of look at some of the, um, some of the trends and, and, I know you've got some real thoughts around some of the ingredients that are that are going in and being utilized. Um, talk a yep. little bit about that. Sure. Yes. So the but the beverage industry, functional beverages, is specifically you know interesting because traditionally has been highly innovative, you know, adding new functional ingredients as well as new and exciting flavors. So we know that you know trends oftentimes start with beverages and then they spill over into confections and other categories. But when it comes to functional beverages, I think you alluded to this a little bit. The classic example is really sports nutrition, mainly increased energy or hydration. And when you're exercising, depending on, on the kind of sport that you're doing, your performance could benefit from you know, carbohydrates in your beverage to provide you know, both short-term or sustained energy. So de depending on what your needs are and what, what, what sport you're actually doing. And when you're losing minerals, classic example, you're sweating, you need to replenish, hydration drinks are certainly a good solution for that. And there's other well-established categories of functional ingredients, probiotics, prebiotics, in support of healthy digestion and healthy immune functions. You know, you mentioned COVID. Of course, you know, you want to be proactive. You know, you want to also support your, your body's defense systems, you know, in that, in that way. So again, a well-established well categories, you know, with some really, really robust and good science behind them. Um, another familiar category, when you feel tired and want to be more alert, are of course the energy drinks. Classic ingredients for increased alertness, you know, it's caffeine. We all run on caffeine in some way, shape or form. Um, often combined, you know, we see those drinks with taurine, glucuronolactone or guarana and B vitamins. Um, some of the newer developments, drinks contain choline, citicholine, you know, and column claims related to this ingredient include enhanced focus and concentration, along with memory and mood support. And then, you know, when you look further, you see also another classic example when you want to build muscle, um, body uh, mass, it's of course well established and understood that you can support your metabolism by providing your body with food that is high in amino acids and proteins. And depending on the biological value of the protein that you're consuming and the bioavailability, you know, these can be converted into body mass. Um, the other area of interest is, um, you alluded to this as well, is stress reduction and, and calming effects. So what we're seeing in this space are beverages, uh, coffee creamers, and also powder mixtures that you can add you know, to your tea or your coffee with adaptogenic mushroom extracts, um, often combined with ashwagandha, other functional herbal ingredients. So very thoughtful blended you know, to really deliver those specific benefits that consumers are looking for. And then you know, also you know, beverages that claim to support cognitive functions like memory, learning, attention, and they use uh, specific botanical ingredients such as here at um, Haritaki and Oswellia to deliver that functionality. And if you think about 
um, the data that you know we see that 29% of people in the US are now choosing foods that support specific body functions and products featuring targeted functional ingredients. I believe that these products will only further increase in popularity and their market presence. Right, right. And I think that that's really important. And, and each of these, I think the interesting thing is that while these things have been around for a long time, they have been very targeted and there have not been a huge number of products on the shelves. And so I think the, the challenge around bringing those things in it seems to be twofold. And, and Anne-Marie, I know you'll have some things to say about this, but one is around really understanding, you know, at what levels to use those, but then also dealing with the challenges that come with making this a great tasting um, thing, because we have, we are kind of, we've moved past that early adopter stage where people have a lot of tolerance for things. They're they're kind of moving forward. Anne-Marie, do you have anything to add to that before we kind of start to talk about more of the trends? Yeah, I, I think, so everything that Bernd mentioned there is something that is very much available in the space, but what really nails it for me is where it comes into your local grocery store or your supermarket. That's when you know something has gone from being interesting and innovative to actually being mainstream. And I think examples of it that I'd see here in Europe even is an increase in gut health products, like whole range mm -hmm. has been launched, dedicated to it in the mainstream space. Um, where caffeine has been around a long time. You don't see as many specific new launches in that space because they're there. So it's usually around innovative flavors and tastes, which we'll talk to. But I think it's the gut health. I do think cognitive health is something we're seeing come into the mainstream as well. And each of these bring their own challenges. And it's like, we, I know we'll talk about this in more detail, but it's not just around taste. It's how do you incorporate taste while still protecting whatever ingredient it is and making sure it's absorbable and mm -hmm. functional for the consumer. So I think it's a very interesting space and I'm looking forward to talking more on the trends. Yeah, well, let's let's take a look at at some of those, I know there are um, there are a number of trends that are really drivers in this market, and and things that we all really need to be need to have some awareness um, about. Let's have you guys talk about those. Sure. Yeah, when you think about um, trends, you know how they feed into the space, especially for functional beverages. You know, one thing that comes to mind. You know, also coming out of COVID is convenience, on the go, things that you can pick up um, and um, have complete nutrition in convenient form. You know, being a handheld packaging and, and beverages actually are a very good, very good uh, solution for that. So um, again, you know, to, to support the busy lifestyles as well as find the right balance, you know, for personal well-being, including um, physical exercise and you know, paying close attention to what you're actually consuming, what you're eating. Right. Right. Yeah, I would build on that and say that some of the, the really interesting ones that I think are really interesting in the market trends are um, things like travel through taste. So like people are moving around more, they're going places, they're mm -hmm. taking advantage of this post-COVID environment. And with that, they're taking taste preferences with them. Um, I read an article recently in Food Navigator as well that kind of um, alluded to the fact that healthy indulgence is a thing of the past. And I would definitely disagree on that. I still think there's a massive market and it's a combination of those things. It's, it's bringing health and wellness to consumers, but in a package that is tasty and nutritious and really excites them and makes them go, Oh, instead of saying, I have to drink this, I want to drink this, I look forward to drinking this, I'm excited to drink it. And I think that's what flavor can really bring. It's how you leverage those those different market trends and utilize them across different regions. Right, right. And I think that that, that, is, um, that is a really great, great point. Baird, I don't know if you have anything to add, you know, to that. Um, yes, so I, I definitely agree. Um, taste is the number one driver of consumer liking. And to your point, Anne-Marie, consumers want functionality. Yes, but this should not mean that they need to sacrifice on taste, right? And, um, you know, uh, the team here at Long, my, my R&D team has worked with a variety of this different product-based materials. 
you know, for example, that you know has some inherent off notes um, that lead to disliking that we were able to mask effectively with our flavor solutions. Right. So, and um, the example the is the, the, the research that we did um, that we've done internally and with external partners to validate, we found that you know certain dairy flavors can also effectively mask off notes. And uh, we also understand that some of the challenges related to the base materials could lead to loss of flavor and undesired change of the flavor profile over time. And um, a good example of this is probably proteins. And for the food developers or food scientists um, in the webinar, you'll appreciate that um, when you have proteins in your, in, in your beverage, uh, there are significant opportunities for flavors to react with the functional groups of those proteins. Um, you have this three-dimensional structure of the protein and the level of denaturation can have a significant impact on the flavor protein interactions. More specifically, now when you have an intact protein um, in your in your product with its quaternary structure intact, you have hydrophobic interactions between protein chains and flavor molecules that could lead to temporary flavor loss. That's one challenge. But when you lose the native structure, when you lose uh, when you have high force in your in your processing or um, um, high high shear force, high heat applications or you know, you have a low pH in your, in your product, that the challenge then, you know, in having proteins, you know, with flavor gets worse since you have more functional groups being exposed to interact with the individual flavor compounds. So um, there's more uh, you know, possibilities to interact with, with the matrix and that could lead to um, irreversible covalent bonds between your flavor molecules and the functional groups in your protein and subsequently then to a permanent loss and a change in the flavor profile. But on the other hand, when you're designing a new food product, you could also leverage the inherent flavor notes that are coming from your base materials to your advantage. So one way to fight off notes is, as I said, you, know, you have flavors that are potent maskers, like some of our dairy flavors, or you work with your base in a way that it supports the profile that you're targeting. So to make it real, if your base is bitter, you, 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 you have your base um, substrate material, you, you could perhaps you know, use it to create a dark chocolate profile. So when I talk to our flavorists, that's what they're already thinking of. They taste the base and they're already thinking, where can I drive this towards? What can I use with, what can I do with this? It's not a blank canvas. It already has some components of the final picture of the piece of art that comes out of it at the end. And then bitter, maybe you can use, you know, you can create a dark chocolate profile um, out of it. Or if you have green notes, you know, some of those um, ingredients, you know, for functionality and, and protein, again, is a classic example, um, you know, have those green, green off notes. Um, you could perhaps drive the profile more towards fruity sensations or inherent beanie or earthy notes when you have when you're battling against against those you could perhaps entertain a product with a nutty flavor profile so long story short you know the the recommendation based on the work that we've we've done would be to work with your base and not against it i hope that makes sense that's a great point and i think Henry, one of the things i'd love to hear you talk a little bit more i mean what i heard from you bernd is um and Henry, you will tend to say things like people start by working with the familiar and we're definitely seeing yeah. that. I mean, every conversation that we're having, particularly in the beverage or snacking industry, people are really looking at these functional things, but you can't make the assumption that because you've solved a taste problem with your current product, you know, the addition of these other things brings in more to it. Um, and, and creates an additional challenge. Can you talk a little more about that, Anne-Marie? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's clear from what Bernd said, it's very complex. So if you're going to simplify mm -hmm. it, the reality is that you can make things very difficult on yourself by adding these ingredients in and just going, let's put a flavor in. But in the ideal world, we think about it from the start of 
So when you're collaborating early on, you get the opportunity to think about what kind of ingredients we need to be working with, the processing that we can look at, how flavors will interact with that. And to Byrne's point, we have created some amazing maskers, but what we do know is that sometimes masking isn't the only solution, like he said. And sometimes it is, or it's a combination, and it's getting the right balance of masking is what you want to truly get to. So my advice to people in working in this space is to, to work with your flavor team. Whoever you have at your disposal, really leverage their expertise. Because we have seen so many times you work on something and you say to somebody, try this flavor at 0.05%. And even at such a small level, even too high, can ruin the whole product. And then you go, oh, well, it doesn't work. And most of the time, people's reaction is to go higher, not, not lower in the flavor. And more often than not, it is a, it is a balance. So mm -hmm. flavor is complex. But when you put it into a matrix like this, where you're dealing with ingredients that we know some of the off notes, like Byrne mentioned, we don't always know what those off notes look like when they interact with those other ingredients, when they go through processing, when they have to withstand shelf life. Is it a ready to make drink? Is it a ready-made drink? Is it sitting on a shelf for six months? What's the shelf life? And it's understanding when you need the right kind of flavor approach. And I know Bernd and his team have worked on some great solutions that really acknowledge that things can change over shelf life and how flavors can be used to manage shelf life changes in flavor. But I think that all of that is what you have to consider as you're developing. So yeah. if there's only one key message anyone takes away from this, it's collaborate if you can early on. Right, and so we've got a couple of really specific questions here. Um, one is, do you have any thoughts, and I think this will be for you, Burned, and then, the, then that is really thoughts around using terpenes as a functional ingredient. Any, any thoughts about that from either of you? Terpenes as a functional ingredient. So we are using terpenes that are part of you know, some certain flavors we're not mm -hmm. using a lot of those in our dairy profiles. The doula that they used for that. So depending on you know, what you're looking for in terms of functionality, do terpenes support the functionality, the claim that you're trying to make? Do you have robust data to support the physi physiological effect? Is the form of your active ingredient available you know, to deliver the, the, the desired outcome? And then when you have those in your product, what could be a, a good a good profile, you know, to 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 deliver in terms of a taste experience? So that it, it's twofold: it's a functionality that needs to be validated, and then secondly, you know, using what you have in your base. And uh, again, terpenes are um, flavor flavors as well. Um, what could be a profile that you know can could come out of this? You know that that would be uh, preferred by by consumers, right? And I know that terpenes are a big discussion around around cannabis CBD kind of based um, products and that sort of thing. Um, I, I think that the that that is where if we see that show up, it's it's I think more there, but not so much as a functional ingredient, is it, Baird? It's more around dealing with it from a flavor. That's working with that's what we have, yes, that's what we're using them yeah. for and um, to deliver certain target profiles. And again, I mean, this is a classic example, you know, what's behind the question, understand, you know, what are you looking for? And then, you know, having, you know, a partner on your side, you know, that understands flavors, understands ingredient and processing technologies. And um, that it's hard to develop a technical solution when you're a food product developer and you're working by yourself, right? But together with other partners that bring that specific expertise, you have a much higher chance of winning. And right. maybe this is a good, a good time to really talk a little bit about our toolbox because we talked about all these issues, but we are not defenseless, right? We have, you know, a toolbox that we can leverage, you know, tools in our toolbox that we can leverage to address taste challenges that are associated with functional ingredients and beverages. Because as we mentioned, consumers are less and less likely to accept, you know, um, tastes in the functional beverages that are not really resonating with them. So we need to really wow them with a positive experience. They have the functionality, but it's also something that they can really enjoy. So um, we actually um, have, have tools there 
that could not only uh, solve technical flavor changes, but also lead to new and exciting profiles that are preferred by consumers. And yeah. what we're leveraging are five areas, really. We're leveraging novel ingredients that we use as building blocks to create new profiles. We use bioconversion you know, and um, of both dairy and non-dairy substrates as that, you know, non-animal derived ingredients gain in popularity. So we are, you know, leveraging both, both areas. We're also looking at controlled release of flavor molecules. So what I mentioned earlier about the interactions with, with your uh, food base material or your beverage, um, we want to mitigate any losses due to the formation of covalent bonds between the food matrix that I mentioned. We are also, you know, leverage encapsulation that can modulate the release of flavor molecules depending on things like uh, temperature conditions and, 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 and other factors. And lastly, you know, what we really explained earlier about, you know, off notes, um, as I mentioned, you know, dairy flavors have um, perform performed well in those situations, especially for plant-based proteins and, and, and other ingredients. So we can extrapolate from our experience whatever your new materials are, you know, to really um, leverage um, our knowledge, you know, and, and be um, partners to mask off nuts and come up with a flavor profile that is uh, preferred by consumers. Yeah, I think there's a great thing, a great point there. I think a lot of people don't realize because we are known as uh, dairy and dairy type, people know that we are in the plant-based world. I don't think they understand that we've been in plant-based, animal-free uh, flavors, and that work for more than 40 years, we, we brought the very mm -hmm. first of those flavors to the market. So not to sell on that, but just to just to um, recognize that we are here as a resource for you, and, and many of these functional ingredients are plant-based ingredients. And so they, um, understanding how those things work and how to work with those profiles, we can really be here for as a recess resource for you. Anne-Marie, here's a really interesting question, and, and we've got a couple of questions around consumer preference, but but kind of elaborating a little more on the consumer decision tree and talking about where do taste and function versus price and portability rank, where are you know, some of those kinds of things? I'd love to hear your you're thinking about that. I've got some some research around that as well that we can share, uh, Joseph. Yeah, and uh, I know that it sounds biased as a flavor company to sit here and go, "Well, taste is the is the key," but it truly is. But I think where there is a difference is when it's the first purchase. You're not obviously going to reel them in on taste on your first purchase. Taste is how you retain your consumer. Um, it really comes down to the function and the price. So often it is a on special offer as an intro and that's what gets the first purchase or they see a claim that resonates with them, gives you energy, helps you sleep depending on the type of product it is. Um, the portability one is an interesting one. It doesn't tend to rank at the top, but the reality is if a consumer can't bring it with them, they're not going to buy it because usually they're buying it on the go that's what they want it for. Beverages have become almost like snacky meals. I, I don't know how else you put it. I would have a snack on the go and consider I've eaten and I'm done. And that's kind of what draws in the consumer. So like, I know I'm not fully answering the question, but it depends on the time at which they're buying. If it's their first purchase, I think you're going to have to bring them in by the, the trifecta of the function price portability. And it's almost, I hate to say it, but they want everything. And then taste is what brick, what keeps them coming back. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the application is, really. It's That's always the issue. What's the most important thing? And there is one thing I have learned over the years, and I've seen many, many surveys done, and I've heard the same feedback from any company. It's that consumers don't always answer as truthfully as you'd like to think they do. So, like, you give the answer on a survey that sounds the most realistic, but you're in the supermarket and you're hungry and you want something quick, you pick up something and that's it. It doesn't matter if it's the healthiest product or if you're stressed out and you know you have another 16 errands to run that day and you see something that says this is going to give you energy and focus for the day, you'll buy it. So it's very right. much situational, I think. 
Yeah, and I think that that's right. I think it definitely depends on the segment. Um, you know, I think that um, one thing to really keep into consideration is this point that Anne Marie made the growth in replacing using snacks and beverages as meals is increasing. We're seeing about a 10% growth on that, which is which is significant. And I think in certain segments, it's higher than that, particularly with younger, um, younger generations, Gen Z, um, younger Gen X. But I think you have to consider the fact that if they are running in to a convenience store or they are grabbing something to have on the shelf, this is definitely true in my household. I know I'm a data point of one, but um, but I see it with a lot of the people around me. I want to make sure that there are things on the shelf that my child can grab at 630 in the morning on her way to practice. And, and you know, replacing a meal with a $4 drink that has protein and and some you know some benefits that will be meaningful to that for her that's not a difficult decision so it is definitely contextual and and marketers as marketers we have to think about how we present that to the market um, because that will have a strong effect on on giving you more price elasticity in terms of how you position it for, for that consumer and what is important to them. So I think that, um, you know, taste and, and function mm -hmm. rank high. And in, in some of the surveys that are out there, you'll definitely see taste show up very strongly, um, particularly with this, you know, and, and Anne-Marie, your point about, if it's a first purchase, it's going to really matter, and that's because these are later, these are the these are the early and late majority that are adopting now. Those early people, I mean, you know, I started out using a pea protein years ago that we thought was so delicious, and I tried it again the other day, and it was awful. And I thought, boy, my tolerance was so great because of what was available in the market at that time, and that was in 2012. I was training for a a marathon, you know, now I would not drink that. I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't use that. So I think that it, you really look at your segments and if you are really looking at that early and late majority, taste is going to really matter in that upfront purchase, but you also have the opportunity to really market and position it um, for, yeah. for specific places. Um, and I would just add, I do think that Again, I know we've mentioned COVID and I know we're quite far out of it, but we're still seeing the effects. And one of the big drivers I've seen is that return to office. So there was a time when people were creating more meals at home and now they're willing to pay a little bit more on the days that they have to go into the office because they want to have something on the go, but still feel like it's nutritious and healthy. And it's been a real driver of the kind of selections that you'd see in your uh, gas stations or in your your grocery stores, your on the go type of purchases, it's a real factor in it because you want something that's going to set you up for the day. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. There's, a, there's a really interesting question and thank you for this, Casey. Um, this is, let's talk about um, consumer per, uh, perception of ingredient labels for functional beverages. And, you know, and, and the question mm -hmm. is, are consumers looking for shortened ingredient lists in these products is there skepticism around these ingredients um, or claims and how oh, yeah. does a brand navigate i think you are recently coming out of a brand i think you can really speak to this um yes so certainly um the more familiar consumers are uh, with functional ingredients the more accepting they are and the more um, they, they believe in the functionality. So the more new or the more innovative your ingredient is, of course, the more education is necessary and the more, you know, it needs to be clear what problem are you solving with this ingredient, making sure that, you know, you have all the regulatory approvals, that you have, you know, strong science, you know, as of course a food scientist, this is an important factor in your value proposition. You have credible, credible uh, data, you know, to support your your value proposition. Now, do consumers all, always read labels? 
probably not, but it's important. And I have an, an example of my personal life where I got a bit into trouble um, when my son asked for uh, Prime drinks. And he does lots of soccer, and all his soccer friends talked about Prime. So I went to the store, saw Prime beverages on the shelf, bought numerous flavors, brought them home, put them in the fridge. And when my wife saw them, she told me, I can't give them to Jan since these are energy drinks and not appropriate for his age. And I realized that Prime has actually two ranges of beverage products, one for energy and one for hydration. You know, he was looking for hydration. I didn't read the label. Um, I should have known better since I'm a professional in the field. But in this, and I always do, in this case, I didn't. And... Um, and he got me into trouble. So, no, this is uh, no harm done. I went back to the store and bought hydration drinks and leveraged the energy ones for myself. But um, it's it's important to read the labels and, um, you know, to make sure that they are clear, they're well understood, um, that there's also no overconsumption, which can lead to all, you know, to different issues. So, um, and, you know, the, 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 the way, you know, the, the, it's important to educate consumers, I guess, is where I'm getting to. Yeah. Um, and the newer your value proposition is, the more effort you need to put into this. And maybe, Denise, you can speak more about in the marketing um, yeah. effort that you need to put into that to create that, that understanding with consumers. And it's interesting. Um, we have a question, and John, thank you for this question. Historically, his question is, historically, this category has had to allocate significant resources to educate consumers. Yes. It's Consumers are self-educating more than previously. How should we refocus marketing resources? Should we significantly pull back on the edu educational part of our spend? I, I think one of the things that I would say, there are two things in here from a market standpoint, and I know, Anne-Marie, you've got some really good thoughts about this as well, but um, people, you know, consumers connect with people, and then they, depending upon depending upon the market segment, they get very caught up in brands and stuff, but it, but, but people have a stronger influence on them. I think that right now, a really important um, part of this is getting in and working with um, influencers. And it doesn't have to be Andrew Huberman. You don't have to, I mean, I don't know what it costs to work with Andrew Huberman. He's a very, good human who wants to bring science to everyone at no cost. So I don't know what that means, but I do know having done a lot of work with, um, with influencers that it can be very, very expensive. But if you start to look more at micro influencers who really have a strong base in your segment and working with them, whether it is through sponsorship or actually through, um, through, you know, being on, podcasts or or um, YouTube shows or those kinds of things, engage with the educators who are out there. And that will really, um, that will save you money. And it will get you in there in a more targeted way. It doesn't mean pull back entirely on the education piece. Um, because, you know, I think like in the case of, of Bernd, um, as the parent, our kids might come home and they have a brand because the kids in their group are utilizing a brand. We see this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we will then go to the website. We will then search and look at as parents. So you do have to think about both of those audiences. But I would say really looking at um, allocation around around influencers and and even building um building influencers in your in your category which is m more costly up front but if you know that this is kind of a long haul for you it's very worth doing um i see a couple of other questions emily uh, has a question wondering about the trends with powdered drink mi mixes versus ready to drink um and um Anne-Marie, I'm going to throw this over your way to start, and if you've got anything to add to the previous conversation, um, but it's I, I do, because I, I slightly agree and I slightly disagree on what you said I, from the point of view right. that, to put context to it, in my, my thinking is it depends on the product and who your target market is, because if your target market is of the older generation, they're not looking on TikTok and Instagram for their educational piece. 
Yeah. So you have yeah. to really be sure about who yes. you're targeting. That's right. Plus, how far along in the journey of education is it? So, like the example I would give again, the reason I keep referring to gut health, it's something that I'm very passionate about as well. And gut health is something that in Europe has really taken off. And it's companies previously were spending a lot of time, a lot of money on marketing, educating. And now there's, for example, there's one guy called Dr. Tim Spector. You might be familiar with him. He has a company called Zoe that is about nutrition, but he partnered. So he, he'd be on Instagram and TikTok promoting gut health and how to look after your gut health and really educating on what does damage, what doesn't. Um, and what products are out there that are worth it and what aren't. He did a collaboration with a grocery store and launched one product, one product onto the market. That product sold out within minutes of being launched. It couldn't be got. I, I tried to go get it myself in the first week. I couldn't get it. It's And it's not a cheap product, but there's a market for it. And I think that's the key is knowing who your market is and leveraging the stage that it's at. Because if it's at the wrong stage, there's no point giving up on education if it's still at the early stage and you don't have a lot of people bought into it. Great, right. Can I, can, um, can I add to this very, very quickly? Sure. Um, because it's like, um, yeah, it's, I think there's no one size fits all solution. And you know, from, my, from my experience, you know, and, and I, I'm passionate about chewing gum, you know, funny, you about gut health, I'm about oral health and oral care. So um, when I was working for Wrigley's, we had, you know, really strong science that, you know, sugar-free chewing gum um, is good for um, for healthy teeth. And uh, the, the reason was not a magic function ingredient. The reason was that the action of chewing gum stimulates saliva, which has all the minerals that are needed to strengthen tooth enamel and reduce the risk of de developing dental caries. So we had all this data and we had the endorsement, you know, not of influencers, but of the dental community, of dentists and dental associations. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at, you know, um, those factors, and that of course had a lot of credibility, you know, with, with you, know, um, you know, with uh, large consumer groups. So um, that, that's another way, you know, to look at endorsements. You alluded, alluded to this a little bit, um, Denise, when, when you talk about, um, the scientists who really promotes um, healthier products. And um, so associations, professional groups, endorsements can be really, really powerful. And I've seen it firsthand in my past. Then we did additional work, you know, because it was in Europe, we needed to apply for um, claim substantiation by the European Food Safety Authority. And, you know, sure enough, we were successful in getting the claim approved. So now, all of the sugar-free chewing gum in Europe that are being sold can have that claim that you know they support healthy teeth and reduce the risk of develop, developing dental caries. Yeah, and so I think that, that those are those are great points. And I think that you know there are ways to really amplify that information. You can share third-party information about some of these kinds of things, mm -hmm. research that's been done. Um, uh, information provided by some of the influencers and scientists and others out in the market. Doctors are a lot of physicians online speaking to some of these things. Um, share that and have your teams share that. Things that are shared by people get much greater engagement and, and recognition. So there are a lot of things that you can do, but you do really have to think about that. Um, in terms of how you educate, not if you educate. Um, I think the other thing, just to go back to Emily's question about powdered drinks versus um, ready to yeah. drink, those, those segments are both growing. Ready to drink is growing at about twice the pace of, of powdered drinks. But, you know, I have been, I allowed myself to drink coffee on screen here because I happen to be drinking a powdered mushroom coffee drink <laughs> and i think that there is also a time and a place for that Anne marie do you have some thoughts about that i do i think that the the trends with powdered drinks are different to those with ready to drink ready to drink lends itself really well to a lot more indulgence whereas powdered drinks tend to lend themselves to more functional you drink them they're quick you you go to the gym and you want a pre-workout shake it's usually something that you can grab on the go. It's not going to be something you pour out of your fridge. 
Um, so I think there's a very di distinct market between the two and it's very much situated around occasion and need. So what you need it for and what the occasion is. So like a lot of the powdered drinks we see are protein fortified, energy um, that you would use for the gym or they're of the category of hydration, vitamins, boosts, energy. And yeah. like I take a lot of those, particularly when I'm traveling, I find they're so convenient to have with you on the go. And to me, that's where there's a big, big difference in those. Whereas I, if I'm thinking ready to drink, it's typically the more indulgent. You see a lot more flavor innovation in that category. Like you don't see a cookies and cream ready to drink type of product, really. It's usually around the standards, vanilla, um, maybe your fruit flavors. That's kind of where we see the, the, the ready to, or the instant dry mixes. But for me, I find more excitement in the ready to drink personally. I also have, like many consumers, a perception around freshness when it comes to ready to drink versus putting something into water and shaking it up. Right. That's right. just me. It, kind of in this same vein, we have a question from Gonzalo. Do you think the whole drinks category will move into functional? I see many brands splitting their portfolio into different benefits. Yeah, I, I don't think we'll see it go completely into functional because there's always a need for, I just want to drink. And I, I'm really fussy. I, I know this is going to sound like a weird one with water. And I find whenever there's something added to water, it changes the taste of it. I, the alkaline pH type ones, they're added, whatever. I'm just not into it. I just want plain water. And I think there's always going to be a category out there who want a soft drink because they're thirsty and they're, they're having that kind of a day where they just they don't need anything extra or you want to have a diet coke without caffeine because you're going to bed in a while and you're just thirsty whatever the case may be i think there'll always be a need to have both streams personally i can't see us moving 100 percent into functional right right no, i, would I agree. agree with this and it's and not everything has to be functional and i think we need to be a bit careful that it all needs to be looked at part of a varied and balanced diet right so um and a, a healthy lifestyle is about, you know, you know, a holistic view, you know, physical exercise, you know, physical activity, I should say, and um, and and the balanced diet. So if everything goes functional, there's very little room for the basic macro micro, micronutrient needs. So I think yes, it makes sense to have this specific functionality when you need it, and uh, that you add, you know, protein to 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 milk, you know, for for your kids to help them in their, in their growth or DHA and healthy brain development, whatever it is. But I don't think every single beverage will move into that, into that space. I mean, there's yeah. like, you need to understand the problem to solve with, uh, uh, for, for your consumers and then tailor your, your product according to this. It's not a one size fits all. Right. My I do think there is a real opportunity if you have a recognized brand in the market that there is that there is trust in that and that bringing that in, you will get sort of elasticity of trust with that. People will have a baseline set of trust and if they yes. are going to try um, a functional beverage, they will be more likely to try yours if it's, you know, if it's bringing in some of those same kinds of, um, of benefits and, and, um, in ingredients. And I do think that ingredients and, you know, are, are important. People are educating themselves about that. I, I love your question, uh, Isabel, about, um, about uh, <laughs> you said, Isabel says, I believe everything that comes from the diary of a CEO, be, that everything from that from the diary of a CEO becomes a trend. Do you think we should be paying more attention to all these podcasts to develop the next generation of products between no sugar, gut health, skin health, rejuvenation, stress, stress control, et cetera. I also am a huge Steve Bartlett fan and love Diary of a CEO. Anybody who does, is not familiar with that podcast, highly recommend it. I do think that it's important um, paying attention to what is going on, not just in the podcasts, but um, looking at, um, at, all of the key social things 
one of our uh, one of our senior application scientists speaks regularly with in in our customer meetings and brings concepts that are coming out of TikTok. Um, she herself is not a big TikTok fan, but her kids are, and she started seeing cooking and culinary things on there as well as Instagram and and YouTube. Um, and definitely, when it comes to the functional things. Um, these influencers and podcasters and YouTube shows that are focused around some of this kind of stuff, you're definitely you're definitely going to see because they have huge audiences, and um, so I think paying attention to that to help spark concepts, et cetera, and then just validating that with looking at your own consumer your own target segment and and making sure that that all makes sense uh together so it doesn't take you away from you know some of your own consumer insights or participating in some things like this but i do think that um that uh you know there is um there is a lot a lot to get there um so um I, I think this is a really interesting question from Akalish. Thank you for, and thank you for your compliment of the webinar. And I know that I probably said your name completely wrong, so my apologies. But, um, but here's an interesting question. With these functional ingredients in a ready to drink, do you see new and novel processing technology in use? Yeah. Bernd, so Marie. I'd love to jump in there. Um, yeah. I think it's happening at two stages. Yes, there is new and novel processing happening at the manufacturing stage, but it's also happening at the ingredient stage. Um, like, for example, I recently saw that a new uh, ATP ingredient that's more stable for ready-to-drink beverages has just come on the line, and ATP being used for more energy drinks. I, I just think that there's so much technology out there that's being used even before it gets to making the beverage. So now that... You, the same as what Berndt has spoken about in terms of our flavors earlier, we're utilizing new techniques to make our flavors more stable to fit some of the processing. I also think that there's better packaging coming online. We're seeing, it, it may not be at consumer level, but sustainability is still a factor. So making your products recyclable or compostable or whatever the need is, means that as a result of that new packaging, you have to find new approaches to manufacturing your products to having them shelf ready or shelf stable over whatever their shelf life is. So there is some of the most exciting, innovating processing coming online, I think, regularly, both at an ingredients level and at a processing and end manufacturing level. Baron, do you want to add anything to that? Yes. So um, innovative processing, but also looking back to very traditional ways of processing that are more natural. So I think um, I, if I would predict, I would say fermentation will certainly see a comeback, you know, will gain more importance in the manufacturing of plant-based foods. And fermentation has been around for um, a long, long time. So I would imagine that, you know, companies would, would uh, try more non-animal derived ingredients, raw materials and substrates to convert into innovative products, you know, with new and exciting textures that solve certain needs meltability, um, stretch, whatever it is, and exciting flavors, of course. So I would predict we see more fermented foods in, in the future, you know, um, in terms of innovations in that space, precision fermentation will um, probably also, you know, deliver some exciting new opportunities. And yeah, that, that's what I would see. Yes, innovative, but maybe leveraging some of the traditional methodologies and, and, and use them to come up with new and exciting value propositions in that market. Right, right. So we are at time, and I know we have several other questions. I want to assure you that we are going to, um, we will get back to you via email and address all of these questions and um, and and share those with, with all of you. I want to thank you. If you look at the screen, um, you will see a link that you should be able to click on. We have developed some demos of functional uh, beverages that might be very interesting for you if you are interested 
in um, in us sending you those demos, please click on that link and um, and fill out the information and we will get those to you. Um, would really like to do that. I wanna thank you, uh, Anne-Marie and Bernd. You guys did a phenomenal job and, and very, very interesting um, information. And I, I trust that it's been really helpful to the audience. So thank you all so much. Again, click on the link that's on your screen right now and, and, um, and we will be very happy to send you uh, an exclusive demo that we've created for this, this group. Bye everyone. Thank you, bye. All right. Thank you. All right.